right, folks, welcome back to DIY Guitar Making. As always, if you like what I do here and you get a little something out of the lessons that I teach, do me a favor, go to ericshaferguitars.com and check out the online courses that I have there. And also, you can check out the schedule of dates for the hands-on workshops that I host here in Burnville, Pennsylvania. Alrighty, so I thought this would be a really good point to bring you guys in right now and show you how I make my molds, okay? Because I'm sort of most of the way through making this mold. Actually, I would probably consider this halfway through. I still have to route this last piece right here, as you can see. And then we do the latch mechanism, which for me, because I'm using MDF on the molds and because that even when I'm not using MDF, if I'm using high quality plywood or something like that, there's a tendency for whatever latch mechanism you use for over time, these screws to pull themselves out of the material. So I do sort of a special a way of creating my latches that's a little bit different that solves that problem. If you guys have a similar problem, I think that might interest you. But anyway, this is a good point for you guys to jump in. Just to cue you in where I started, I first drew out my shape onto two pieces of MDF and shaped that by hand on the spindle sander um, with a little bit of hand work using files to get into this area right here and the chisel ultimately to get into the very tip. And then I glued that down to a piece, a larger piece of MDF and cut out that shape on the bandsaw as close to the line as I was comfortable and then routed so that I got a perfect duplicate of the first piece bringing us to where we're at now, where we're glued down to the final piece. It's already been bandsaw cut out, and now we just have to route it away. So why don't we start there? Let's go head over to the router, and I'll talk to you guys over there. Okay, I know I said I was going to the router first, and a router this is not. This is the spindle sander. Um, I just realized that on my way over to the router that I really want to trim this down closer to the line first. I always like to leave as little of material as I possibly can, especially when I'm using three quarter inch MDF um, for that router bit to chew into. It just makes the job way more pleasant. You're not gonna get, I'm not worried the whole time that it's going to jump or lurch on me. All right, so nothing really to talk about here. I'm gonna go ahead and trim this down. Okay, so here we are at the router table. I actually have a couple different router tables here in the shop. These are very simple to make though. You can see this router table I have over here, which I use specifically for cutting the truss rod slot into my necks. This uh, is a product you can buy, but hey, you know how easy it is to make a router table? This is just two sheets of plywood glued together. The two sheets give it more rigidity, so it's less likely to kind of warp and lose its flatness over time. Plus, any flat, any sort of warp or cup that's already in the one sheet, if you glue them up right, you'll actually pull the cup out of both sheets. So anyway, that's just a little tip there. And then beyond that, drill a couple holes to install the router there. And I just cut out a big hole into this table here. And actually, this just sits inside that hole, and that's not a problem. Um, I could fasten it down if I wanted to, but it's so heavy that this doesn't move within its hole there. And you know what? I'll show you. I'll show you what I mean. So I just wanted to share that with you guys uh, so you weren't intimidated by router tables. It's really one of the easiest things you can build for yourself. Although sometimes buying products like that Bosch one I just showed you is nice because they come with a lot of special features like feather boards and um, a fence with hookups for your dust collection and all that. But as a bare bones thing, you don't need any of that. All right, so I wanna extend my bit out far enough 
that the bearing will be resting on the template. So this is what is called is a flush trim router bit because it will cut as far into this wood as the bearing will allow it. And that bearing is perfectly flush with the blade. So it will, won't allow it to go any further than the template piece, which the bearing rides across. This, by the way, is a white side bit. White side is a company that produces very high quality bits that are very expensive too. It's a spiral bit. And the nice thing about having a spiral router bit, I got this for this purpose. I always use this router table for for making templates and molds and, and all that sorts of thing, essentially for pattern routing. And I wanted a high quality spiral bit. The spiral part is nice because it doesn't uh, present the full height of the blade to the wood all at once like a straight cut bit does. Here, I'll show you a straight cut bit. This right here is a straight cut bit. So that, the blade's just going straight up and down, and so when it encounters the wood, that blade, the full height of that blade just goes thwack right into that wood as it enters. And for that reason, it's much more stressed, the blade is, or the bit, I should say. The bit is much more stressed and more inclined to kick that piece of wood back at you um, if, say, for example, you maybe presented it with a little too much material for it to eat. So yeah, with the spiral bit, you can get away with a lot more, and I like that. All right, let's go ahead and route this thing. Plug this in. And normally I keep, you know, my machines plugged in at all times, but this whole area back here, this whole room, is in a state of flux and has, has been in that state for over a year now where I'm just kind of moving things around, testing out different areas and seeing what I like before I commit to it. This back room is, the idea for this room is to have it be a room where all the heavy mill work and heavy sanding operations happen so that I can better control the dust. Once I get the placement of everything figured out, then I will commit to those placements more and build uh, my dust collection for this area. Okay, I think we're ready to go. And now to do the other side, the only difference here is that we have to get into this little corner here. And of course, a round bit will not be able to get all the way into the corner. Oh, this corner too as well, by the way. Both of these corners. The round bit won't be able to get all the way in, but we'll get as far in as we, as we can. And then the last little bit, it's just hand tools. Woo! All right, so um, you may have noticed that I went through the trouble of also truing up the outside of these and I just want to make the point which may already be obvious to you that the outside doesn't really matter all that much it just kind of gives you a nice clean looking mold at the end if everything's duplicated to that exact drawing that you drew out the first time but the truth is the outside, uh, the, the various pieces that make this up, they could not be duplicated perfectly, right? You could just kind of rough cut the outside shape and not even bother with the router bit uh, if you want to. It's really the inside that needs to be perfect. All right, let's keep going. All right, so we can go ahead and 
carve out the inside of this Florentine cutaway now. Essentially, I'm just resting the back of the chisel against the curve and trying to extrapolate that curve out. Just following, going where that curve already wants to go with my chisel. And it doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, once you see what we're going to do next, you'll know why. Okay, so now what we need to do is make two cuts coming right off of the tip on both sides, following that curve. So one cut kind of like that, and one cut kind of like that. And here, I want to show you this on a mold that is already completed so you can see what I'm talking about. So just like that, and that's simply because when we do a Florentine cutaway, when we cut out our individual pieces for the sides, we want to cut them a little bit oversized with some overhang so that when we glue this in, we'll have our blocks in place. There'll be a neck block there and a little tip block right there. And the excess side is going to extend past the tip block and tuck into here just a little bit. Okay? Or alternatively, this piece will tuck into here. But either way, you want to sort of blow out both of those sides. Alright, that's what I'm talking about. So at this point we are going to install the latch mechanism here. And I like to use this toggle clamp latch. But as you'll see, here I'm going to pull this out. There's two of them in this package, which is exactly how many we need. As you'll see, the mechanism involves this piece and then this piece for it to latch onto. We're just going to throw this piece away and not use it. As you're going to see, I'm going to modify this a little bit different like you see on these three molds that I have out right here. And ultimately we're going to use this dowel as a replacement for this secondary piece right here. You know, when you see this, you might think, well, this is a lot of sort of extra work when you could just use the latch mechanism as it was intended and just put some screws in there. However, I, I have had in my shop at least 12 different molds that I've built over more than a decade. And the first mold that I ever built was in 2010 and I've been building and using molds ever since. One thing that I've noticed in the short term, it was totally fine to just put these latches on the normal way, let's say. But after 
many years of use, I noticed that regardless of what material I used to build the mold out of, and I brought three molds out here just to show you, I've tried every type of material. This is particle board, which is total garbage, by the way. Do not use particle board. Um, I mean, this mold still works out for me, but particle board chunks off, and it's just a horrible material. This is MDF, much better than particle board. Still, though, not as good as high-quality plywood. Now, the new mold we're building today is out of MDF and not the high-quality plywood, because really, the plywood, even though it's better, um, it's hard to justify the extra cost of it, especially nowadays. And the MDF works fine, especially when we do the latch mechanism with this little pad here, like you're going to see. So anyway, no matter what material I used, I found that over time the screws would start to pull out. At first I noticed that I kept tightening these down to adjust the positioning of the latch, um, but really what I was doing is I was constantly compensating for the fact that the screws were pulling themselves out of place. Um, especially on the particle board that pulled out very very quickly I just wanted to give you that as a little background because yes in the short term you, you might have molds right now where you don't have this sort of setup and they're working out just fine and hey if they continue to work fine just just keep it like that do it like that forever but if you do start to notice this problem that I'm talking about I think you're going to find something of value out of the way that I've done this here all right, so with that preface there, let's talk a little bit about what I've done here on these ones. Essentially what we're gonna do is we're going to glue these pads down here because the screw going directly into, let's say the MDF or the particle board, that's just gonna pull out. So putting a piece of hardwood there gives something better for those threads to grab onto. Now, even on the high quality plywood, it still, doesn't hold as well as you would think because the screw is not going down straight through all the plies. It's actually going along the plane of the laminations themselves, so straight in. And so you're not really getting the value of those laminations uh, the way that you would if your screw was going this way. Now, so that pad is going to solve that problem. Now the other thing is, uh, don't use screws. Use, here I have them here. We're going to use bolts because bolts can have fine threads. So you want a fine threaded bolt like you see here. And it's a good idea too to get fairly long bolts. Let's see how long this is. 30 millimeters. And let's see if there's a pitch to the thread. But really you're just looking for fine. It's an M6 1 by 30 So yeah, something like that. The head doesn't really matter. Some of the bolts I have are um, a pan head and other ones are this socket head. And then lastly, we're going to install a dowel and cut a little notch into the dowel so that it can accept the latch mechanism. And the, what the dowel does is you put that dowel into the hole and it's not glued into that hole. It's actually just placed in there. And so it almost acts like a relief or a, yeah, relief, that's the word, a relief valve in that when you tighten this down, if it's too tight for the position of this, then the dowel will actually pull itself up just a little bit until it equalizes with that tension. So you can never really clamp this down too tight in that way. This will always release some of that pressure by rising just slightly. Okay, so that has solved my issue completely. And these are now a lifetime thing, right? This, the, the, I absolutely do not anticipate um, these molds needing any follow-up attention over the years. All right, with that said, let's do this. Okay, so with this clamped down in perfect alignment, I just like to flatten this area before I stick down my two little, in this case, mahogany blocks, but any hardwood would be fine for this. 
All right, so those are nice and flat. Go ahead and flatten the other side. Okay, so let me show you how this mechanism works. Now you may have noticed when I drilled these holes and located the latches and the dowels that um, I didn't take great pains to put them in any particular place. I did use a marking gauge uh, and that was just so that they would all be in the same place relative to the other one, if that makes sense. Um, so I, I didn't want it to be totally random. But anyway, the point is, it doesn't matter too much where you put this dowel, how far back you put it, or how close you put it to the latch, simply because these latches have a large range of adjustability. So you can see right now that that leaves a big gap. So we're going to move this nut forward. until this bites right down into that notch. All right, so that's solid now. All right, let's go ahead and set up the other side the same way. And then finally we can drill the location dowels here and here, which we'll talk about in a moment. Okay, so let me show you what we're going to do here now is we are going to drill a hole right on center right at the seam and install this dowel and we're going to do that on both sides just so you can see what I'm talking about there. So this is glued into place and here's the other dowel on the other side and that just fits right in there like that and that's going to keep it from being all squirrely and wanting to shear from side to side when you clamp these so that every time you have a reliable position that is precise when you close this up all right so let's get this one out of the way i just wanted to bring in finished mold out here to show you that and here, the one we're about to work on, you can see what I'm talking about, how when you clamp this, it's gonna be pretty close, but you can see how, if you wanted to, you can you know, pull on it and it'll just shear off of center there. 
that's what the positioning dowels prevent. First, I want to pull this to the edge and just make sure that I have a nice continuous plane running across the seam there. I don't want to be all, uh, you know, sheared off of my perfect center there. So once that feels good, both here and here, I'm going to go ahead and clamp that. Okay, there's my center. Although it honestly wouldn't matter if it was on center, if it was back here or up there. It wouldn't make a difference, but um, it would look a little funky. Okay guys, home stretch now. I'm gonna cut this off with a flush cutting saw. And then we'll put it in on the other side. Just got to glue these in. Very simple glue up. Just a little piece of wax paper so it doesn't stick to the other side. You don't want to glue your whole jig together. You want it to just stick to one side. And then your clamp is just the latch. You don't need anything more than that. Okay, and that's really it. That's all you need to do guys. So once this dries and you know, I could wait as little as 45 minutes, but honestly there's no rush on this. So it's probably gonna sit here all day and then even overnight just because I got other things to do. Um, but again, 45 minutes is a good minimum time if you want to, uh, you know, use it right away. But hey, that's it. Hope you guys got something out of that. And um, yeah. Thank you for watching. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye for now. If you learned something here, please give this video a like and subscribe so you can be notified when I release a new DIY guitar making video. And if you want to really learn more, take one of my structured online courses at ericschaferguitars.com or register for a hands-on guitar building workshop here with me in Burnville, Pennsylvania.